Thanks so much, Wendy. Yeah. Thank you all for having me here. Um, I am Julie Milder. Um, I'm a medical science liaison with Greenwich Biosciences. And what that means is that I am a field-based scientist. So I live here in Denver, um, have been thrilled to work with Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado uh, for the last few years um, in this role. And my job is primarily to teach and to learn. So um, I've been in epilepsy for 15 years. It's my passion. Um, I studied epilepsy in graduate school. I have a PhD in neuroscience and, um, and then I got pulled into epilepsy through the science in graduate school. And um, after that, I spent almost six years working for CURE, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, um, based in Chicago, a nonprofit organization that is the largest private funder of epilepsy research. Um, I worked there as a research director and worked with epilepsy researchers in 13 countries, um, got to know all of the national um, advocacy organizations for Epilepsy Foundation, as well as all of the syndrome groups. Um, and then found myself here at Greenwich um, about three and a half years ago when they were first building a field medical affairs team, which is what we're called. So um, Greenwich is the US subsidiary of GW Pharmaceuticals. So GW has been around for over 20 years studying cannabinoids, um, looking at the cannabis plant and finding ways to study it for uh, medicinal purposes in a pharmaceutical way. And um, so Greenwich was, they came to the US about five years ago um, to run clinical trials, specifically in rare pediatric onset epilepsies is how we started. And, um, and I was one part of that first field medical team. So I go out and I educate. And the main thing I've been educating on these three and a half years is cannabis. Um, it's one of those things that has sort of taken off from a patient driven perspective um, before doctors were really learning about it. And so it's one of the things I talk about the most and I love talking about it. Um, so tonight I'm going to kind of take you through um, real high level sort of how we got here. And, um, and so our plan for uh, tonight is to talk about the history and regulation of cannabis in the US and kind of describe how we ended up in this place. Introduce cannabinoids. What does that term mean? Um, what are cannabinoids? What are the ones we know about? What, how is it that we've come to this place where people think that cannabis is the cure-all for everything? And why does that make sense in some way um, based on the science that we know? And I'm gonna share some web-based resources for you so that if you want to continue your education in this space, you have a place to go. Um, I'm not going to talk about Epidiolex, which is the product that Greenwich um, launched in the epilepsy space a little over two years ago. Um, however, I know that there are, there's probably interest in that. So when we get to the end and have questions, um, you're welcome to ask about anything. Um, but this talk is going to focus really on the science behind cannabis and cannabinoids. And as Wendy mentioned, if you jumped on a little later, please feel free to send questions into the chat. Um, we're going to hold the questions till the end. So how did we get here, right? So cannabis has been used medicinally for thousands of years. We have documented uses going back 5,000 years. And so it was used as a medicine way longer than it was considered an illicit drug. Um, it was in Merck's manual. Um, in 1899, describing potential uses of cannabis. And Merck's manual is where all the drugs live that we have, that we use as medicines. Um, and so what changed? Um, there were a few things and it all happened fairly recently. Uh, a big thing was in 1937, there was a tax act passed and it did, while it did not make the use of cannabis illegal, it taxed it so highly that it effectively prohibited it because people couldn't afford to get it. And pharmacists were imprisoned if they didn't impose that tax. And so while it was legal, um, it was really difficult to obtain because of that tax. And that was a political move. It had nothing to do with, you know, fear about it being a drug of abuse or anything like that. It was a political move. The main thing that led to where we are today 
was the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. And what that did is it set up the five schedules of drugs. And so schedule one being the most restrictive, schedule five being the least, and then many, many drugs we have aren't scheduled at all. They are completely descheduled. And so when um, a drug goes through clinical trials and submits all their data to the FDA, FDA evaluates it for safety first and then efficacy in that disease or for that symptom, whatever it is. And then it's the DEA that looks at the drug and decides if it has any potential for abuse um, or if it, they were worried that it's not safe or it can be turned into another illegal drug, anything like that. And the DEA then places that, they either don't schedule it all or they place it in one of the five schedules. So when this system was set up to control substances in 1970, schedule one was defined by three things, high potential for abuse, lack of accepted safety, and no accepted medical use. So this is where all of our most illicit substances lie um, because they have no accepted medical use. And all cannabinoids that could come from the cannabis plant were placed into schedule one. So cannabis and marijuana, as it then became termed as the drug, uh, the drug form of the plant, marijuana, has been in schedule one from a federal standpoint since 1970. So this is what you would hear a lot about right now. People are pushing to get it out of that designation um, because they don't think it's as dangerous as a lot of the things that even live in schedule two. Because in schedule two, we have things like our opioids because they have an accepted medical use. You can get it prescribed for you, which means it cannot be schedule one, but because of the high potential for abuse, they sit in schedule two. And so what does this mean for a company like ours who's trying to research these things? Um, it is very, very difficult to do research on a schedule one substance. You have to have a special license to do that both federally and at the state level. So they, they did create a, a path for people to research Schedule One substances, but it's complicated because they created this closed system, which meant that only those authorized and registered by the DEA to handle those substances can produce them, can transport them, can hold them. And so the researcher has to obtain the proper registration from the DEA and the state in order to obtain those products. And then they have to have a room that has a safe with all with cameras on it and double locks and you know all of these things they have to meet. Um, it's very expensive to do and it can take a lot of time. It's a lot of red tape. In addition to that, um, if you are a federally funded researcher, which most are, like researchers at the University of Colorado have grants from the National Institutes of Health. That's how they do their research is they apply to them to get money to do their research. And if they are funded by a federal grant and they want to do research on cannabis, they then have to obtain the cannabis from the one US facility that's federally approved for growing cannabis for research. And that is the University of Mississippi. This year, the DEA did accept applications from other potential growers um, to be a source for research purposes. Um, they have not authorized anyone else to do it yet though. So it still is only the University of Mississippi. And there are some problems with that because the University of, of Mississippi for many, many years was only growing one strain of cannabis for research. And now they do, they have a high CBD product. Um, they have a couple others, but with that one strain, last I heard in Colorado, we have about 50,000 different strains. So what people are using um, is not represented by what you can research. So there's, there are a lot of problems um, with this, with the research of cannabis in the United States. Um, and so there's a push to try and at least fix this part to allow researchers to access cannabis for research um, in an easier way, because right now it's really, really challenging. So that's kind of how we got here. Let's talk a little bit about the cannabis plant. So when I talk about cannabinoids, cannabinoid is just a term that, it means a group of chemical structures that meet certain criteria. Just like we have different kinds of carbohydrates, um, right? Like we all hear about the different types of carbohydrates and some are better for you and some are not. 
They're defined by their chemical structure. It's the same for cannabinoids. It's just a class of chemicals that meet certain criteria to be a cannabinoid. Within cannabinoids, we have three different classes of them. The phytocannabinoids, phyto means plant, are the ones that we're primarily gonna talk about, the ones that come from the plant. But we do also have endocannabinoids, the ones that exist endogenously in our body that were discovered after the phytocannabinoids. So that's why they're called cannabinoids at all even, is because the cannabinoids were named because they were discovered in the cannabis plant. And we also have synthetic cannabinoids, ones that are made in the lab. And so I will very briefly touch on those. But we're gonna spend most of our time on the phytocannabinoids, the cannabis plant. So cannabis sativa is the species. So everything in, you know, in nature and living things has a species name. Cannabis sativa is the species. Within the species, there are many varieties. Historically, there were varieties that you would see like the ones on the left. So sativa, you might, and you might hear this, there was a sativa variety of cannabis sativa. So sativa is this tall, highly branched plant. And so people said that if you looked at it, because of the way it looked, they said, ah, that one is good for getting you high. That one's gonna have more THC in it. THC is a cannabinoid and it's the one that gets you high. And we'll come back to that. Whereas if you saw this short sort of broadleafed bushier plant, you would say, oh, that one's an indica variety. That one's gonna chill you out more because it has more even levels of THC and CBD, the two principal cannabinoids in the plant of many. The truth is that today, and I'm mentioning this because I know I've been in the dispensaries here in Colorado and the bud tenders love these terms. They love to tell you, you know, what are you looking for? And okay, you're looking to, you want to get high. I'm going to recommend a sativa product for you. Or, oh, you want to relax. I'm going to recommend an indica product for you. The truth is that today, these distinct varieties no longer exist. Everything is a hybrid. They've been so highly interbred. There is no pure indica product out there anymore because there's not an indica plant. There's not a pure sativa variety anymore. Um, and so the only way to know what the cannabinoids are in your plant and then that end up in your product is by chemically analyzing it. So really now these are used primarily as marketing terms. So I mentioned CBD and THC. These are two cannabinoids from the cannabis plant, but there's now over a hundred that have been identified. And they all are, while related structurally, have very different effects on your brain and your body. And so this is why I think, you know, when you think about it as the cannabis plant as a drug, it's important to know what's in it because you wouldn't take a prescription drug, you know, you wouldn't take your cholesterol medicine if it had a hundred different components at different levels every single time you took it. That wouldn't make any sense. That's not how we do medicine. You need to know what's in there and at what level. And so from a company standpoint, that's why our company was founded, we were a research company, and the idea was let's research these different cannabinoids individually and in specific combinations so we know what they're doing. Because people keep saying this plant does all these things. Well, which cannabinoids are responsible for those effects? Um, it's hard to tell until you actually study it. And so the two main cannabinoids, the ones that are the most prominent in the plant, are CBD and THC. So that's, those are the ones we hear the most about. THC is the one that's responsible for marijuana's euphoric effect. It gets you high. Um, and it also, there are some FDA-approved synthetic products. So they're, they don't come from the plant. They're made in a lab to look just like THC or similar to THC. And I'll touch on those um, very briefly because they are prescription products that resemble THC. Um, CBD, while very similar to THC in structure, has a completely different effect on your body. It does not get you high. Um, and CBD is the one that we put through clinical trials for the anticonvulsant properties. And now there is this FDA approved product, Epidiolex, which comes from the plant um, and is approved for seizures associated with Dravet and LGS. And now recently, um, this slide was not updated in the last two weeks, now for seizures in tuberous sclerosis complex as well. And so very different effects, even though they're very similar molecules. 
And these ones in the middle are just an example of some of the others you might hear about. Some of them are starting to float around out there in products. CBDA, THCA, CBDV, THCV. There's over a hundred of these in the plant. And so this is why I say it's important to know what's in there. And it's also important for researchers to study them because they're all gonna do different things. So while we talk about phytocannabinoids and we've been talking about them in the cannabis plant, this is just a note to say that you can find cannabinoids in other plant species, um, but you're not gonna find the same ones that you get from cannabis. Like you're not gonna find THC in your black pepper. But again, because cannabinoid is just a type of chemical based on its structure, you can find them in other plants. Um, but in the cannabis plant is where we find the ones that we are most interested in, the ones that have been studied the most. And it's how we discovered this whole class of molecules, these cannabinoids, is because of cannabis and its ability to get you high. And THC was the one that led to the discovery of everything else. I found this interesting when I first learned about, when I was first learning about cannabis, because when we think about marijuana, we think about the big green leaves. The truth is, is that in order to get THC, CBD, or any of those cannabinoids, in order to get them out of the plant, what you really need is you need the plant to flower because most of the cannabinoids are gonna be found in those flower, in the flowering portion of the plant. You're not going to be able to get them from seeds, roots, stems, or leaves. And this is important when we talk about the product categories that are out there, because I'm gonna talk quite a bit about hemp because it's very confusing right now. So just remember that in order to get a, an appreciable amount of cannabinoid from a plant, it has to flower because that is where you find the cannabinoids in the plant. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these four sort of buckets of categories that are out there right now for cannabis products. Going from left to right, it's the least regulated to the most. So we're gonna start with hemp. Hemp was historically grown for its fibrous stalk and seed, which as I just said, is not where the cannabinoids really live. And so that's why DEA didn't care. They're like, yes, grow your hemp with this big tall stalks and take its seeds and turn it into oil because they knew they weren't going to have to worry so much about high levels of things like THC. They did put a legal definition on it that said it had to be less than 0.3% THC. But hemp, historically, it was grown for, you know, it, turning it into things like paper and fabrics. Um, and so no one cared about what hemp was doing in terms of producing cannabinoids. And before December 2018, the way that the Schedule I um, description of marijuana was phrased was all cannabinoids that could come from the marijuana plant, basically, were Schedule I, which would include any cannabinoids extracted from hemp. What happened in December of 2018 was the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 was passed, which people refer to as the Farm Bill. Included in the Farm Bill was language that descheduled cannabinoids extracted from hemp specifically. So we had that, those five schedules, one being the most restrictive, and then things don't have to be scheduled at all. So what it did was it took, if you could get, what they were doing was they were prepping for CBD coming from hemp, right? They said, if we can get CBD from hemp, we don't want it to be scheduled at all. Instead of being schedule one, it went to no schedule. This is why, and this is not, we do see this here in Colorado, but like I did this talk a couple weeks ago for a group in Nebraska where they don't have anything legal yet. There's no medical marijuana legal, there's no recreational, but all of a sudden they have these hemp CBD stores popping up everywhere in this last year and a half or so. And that was because of this. The truth is, is that when they passed this in December of 2018, they said that before it was really truly legal, they needed to set up a system to regulate all these hemp products. And here we are a year and a half later or more, and they are just starting to even touch on this. They've received, the states were allowed to present their own plans to the federal government to regulate this. Um, and they have started doing that, but they still don't have a system in place to regulate these products. So when I say that they are the least regulated, I say that because like here in Colorado, our marijuana system to go into those, to, to run a dispensary, there's quite a bit you have to do in order to get that license. And you have to abide by a whole lot of rules. And you have to, there are testing requirements. There are 
problems with testing, but at least they are required to test somehow for something. These hemp products that are being sold in the grocery stores and online and anywhere, they are not required to meet any sort of testing requirement. They don't have to have a license to produce those products. So no, there's no oversight over them. And so that's why I think those are, from a public health standpoint, the riskiest products to consume. And part of that is also because the cannabis plant is known to clean soil. Hemp is what was planted on the grounds of Chernobyl to clean the soil, and then they destroyed all, the, all of the plants because it's really efficient at sucking what's ever in that ground right up into that plant. And so if you think about that, when it's now being turned into something for human consumption, it's a little scary. And so that's why there are testing requirements out there for the marijuana products that are being sold in the dispensaries for things like heavy metals, toxins, pesticides, and fungus, anything that's in the soil where that plant is grown can end up in that finished product if it's not tested for. And so I just think that regulating hemp is gonna be a big challenge um, and it needs to happen because they're still saying that the legal definition is anything less than 0.3% THC, but we also have seen reports of THC being higher than that in a lot of these products. No one's checking. <laughs> So the middle two buckets, recreational medical marijuana. Um, there's no difference in these products. When you walk into a dispensary here, you know, here in Denver, in some of these that have, the, they have the two rooms, products are the same on both sides. Um, just because it's a, you're, if you have a card that allows you to go into the medical side, all it means is that you can be 18 to go in there if you have a card, you have to be 21 to go into the recreational side. It's taxed differently. And the limits are different, right? You can purchase more on the medical side than on the recreational side. Other than that, everything is the same. Just because it, is, it has been termed medical marijuana does not mean that we know anything more about those products. We don't know more about their safety. We don't know more about their efficacy for certain symptoms if they work. Um, and we don't, and they aren't better products in any way in terms of, you know, that they are um, regulated any differently. Same product on both sides. The only difference is the intent of the use, right? So medical, the intent is to relieve a symptom. Um, recreational is for pleasure and fun. And then on the far right, we do have pharmaceutical formulations, right? So these can be plant derived from grown, extracted from the plant, grown out of a plant or synthetic made in a lab. And these are controlled preparations that have to meet the FDA standards. So purity, consistency, stability, safety, efficacy. Basically, you know that anytime Again, if I go back to cholesterol medication as the example, every time you take your medication, you know exactly every dose is going to be the same. Your doctor knows how to dose it. They know what side effects to look for. There's data behind it from very large studies um, to make sure that it is safe. That's what FDA cares about first is safety. If something's not safe, they don't care if it works, right? They want to know it's safe first. So we have quite a spectrum in this space of cannabis products. Um, and it's, I'll tell you, it's been a very interesting space to enter with a pharmaceutical, a new pharmaceutical playing in this space um, because it is, there's a lot going on out there. Just to touch a minute on the endocannabinoids, details are not important. Uh, these top two, anandamide and 2-AG, are the ones that were, um, that we have been studied the most. And so after we discovered THC, what do scientists do? They say, oh, there must be, if, if there's these things in the brain that react to THC, there must be something already in there that the brain is using. And they went looking for them and this is what they found. So they have nothing to do with getting high, anything like that. They have a role in things like um, memory and learning um, and, and so, and immune function. So there's just, there are other things in our body that use this system that basically the cannabis plant has hijacked, which is what drugs do. And then we have synthetic cannabinoids. So as I mentioned, there are some FDA approved, so pharmaceuticals that are um, synthetic THC products, so made in a lab. And these are um, indicated for things like anorexia um, in AIDS and nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy. Um, and so they're THC based products and they have been approved by FDA, but they're made in a lab. So when we got Epidiolex approved um, two years ago, it was the first um, cannabinoid that came from the plant that was approved by FDA. 
just to mention, there are also these illicit synthetic cannabinoids, things like spice and K2, and these are really nasty illegal street drugs. Um, and the scariest thing about them right now is that they have been showing up as contaminants in other products out there. So there have been some stories out there um, from a couple different states of people thinking they're taking a CBD product, ending up in the ER, and they find out that these um, products were contaminated with things like some of these type of cannabinoids. These very, they're very potent um, and they're really, really dangerous. And so um, you might hear people talk about these cannabinoid receptors. I'm only gonna mention it because in order to understand why people think that the cannabis plant is this be all and end all of curing everything, I think it's important to, to think about this scientifically, which is that when THC was discovered, the next thing that they said was, well, what in the brain is THC attracted to? And they identified these two receptors, they call them, these little things that stick out from your cells. Um, and you know, they all are attracted to different things in your brain. And they named them CB1 and CB2 for cannabinoid one and cannabinoid two. And they said, oh, this is what THC is doing. The problem with calling them cannabinoid receptors is that then a lot of people believe that that's the only thing that cannabinoids do. But we have over 100 cannabinoids. And so now what we know, again, detail's not important, just that there's a lot of things that cannabinoids do. They can interact with basically every system in your body depending on which cannabinoid you're looking at. And so that's why I think it makes sense that people will take one product and say, oh, my headache's gone. Someone will take another product and say, oh, my anxiety's gone. Someone will take another product and say, oh my gosh, I'm sleeping great. Um, and then we can we know that there are effects on seizures and we know there are effects on nausea. Um, and that's because depending on which cannabinoids are in there having an effect, it could be doing so many different things in your body. And that is why I, from a scientific perspective, it's so important to know what's in those products. And it's really important for researchers and doctors to now be able to study them, to understand which cannabinoids do what to the different things in your body and your brain. So where we are today, and this is hopefully now just going to grow, there's been so much attention in this space that I think that we're at a really exciting time that if people can start doing more research, we will learn more about the potential for this plant. So what we know, what's in, you know, been published um, in the literature, so people who are doing legitimate research on cannabinoids, we know that there are cannabinoids that can improve the survival of cells, decrease neuronal excitability, that's that epilepsy piece, right? So we wanna calm the cells down if they're overly excited, and we know that CBD can do that. We've seen effects on the inflammatory response and inflammation in the body and the brain. Neuronal plasticity is how your brain changes. If it loses that function, it's really hard to repair when there's injury. And we've seen that there are cannabinoids that can help that. And the same with neuroprotection. It can, can protect brain cells from dying when there's been an injury. And so this is just the beginning, I think, of understanding what cannabinoids can do therapeutically. And when we look at where we have products that are available for people, um, in the US, we now have the anticonvulsant, which is a highly purified CBD product for epilepsy. Um, and then the antiemetic is the anti-nausea property of the synthetic THC products and the appetite stimulation, um, as I mentioned, also the synthetic THC product that is um, for AIDS wasting disease. And then antispasticity, there's a product that's not available in the US, um, but, there, but it's a combination product of, um, it's two main strains that contain THC and CBD, but also has minor cannabinoids in it. So it's more complicated, but it's regulated and it's for spasticity and multiple sclerosis. And then in some um, countries, it is also available for cancer uh, related pain. And so, there are cannabinoids out there that are being studied and approved. There's just not that many yet. And so I think that we are getting there. Um, and hopefully uh, now that FDA is getting more comfortable with it in the US, we'll be able to start to really ramp up some of this research and bring more products into the pharmaceutical space where they are regulated um, and where you know what is in every bottle, every pill that you take. And so just to wrap up, and then I'll take 
questions. I want to make sure I left time for questions. Um, I wanted to share a website with you. The web address is at the bottom. It's cannabinoidclinical.com. This is a website that was built and is maintained by Greenwich, but it is not product related. You has nothing to do with Epidiolex. Um, it is a purely educational website and it is there to help you. Um, it has wonderful articles and links to um, research and links to news. And then there's, you know, if you just want to like dig into what's the difference between CBD and THC, that's in there. Uh, I think the best page is there's a link at the top that says resources. And you can find, um, I know that Epilepsy Foundation has used these a lot and we always bring them when we are at EF events, but our glossary of terms um, that has all the different terms that you would hear if you're trying to talk to a doctor or a, another friend or even a bud tender about things to understand it has a PDF version that you can download. Um, there's a discussion guide for talking about cannabis-based products with your doctor. Um, if it's something that you are trying to have that conversation about, know what questions to ask. Um, it's just really great. And so, and you can also sign up to receive updates. There's a newsletter that goes out now. And that's the only thing you would get if you sign up there. Um, I promise you that we're a pharmaceutical company. We can't send you unsolicited information. So if you sign up for this, that's the only thing we'll send you. Um, and I just think it's a really wonderful resource. And so with that, um, just to, it was a very high level overview of the fact that people have been using cannabis as medicine for 5,000 years. It was very recent that um, regulations were put in place that made it hard to research. And if you make it hard to research, you're not going to get drugs approved by FDA because you need that research in order to ask FDA for that approval. Three classes of cannabinoids can impact your body, the endogenous ones, endocannabinoids, the plant-based ones, the phytocannabinoids, and the ones that are made in the lab, the synthetic cannabinoids. And while we have these two receptors, the cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, that were identified after THC was discovered, we now know that, they're, that cannabinoids interact with many, many, many things in your brain and your body. And that's why we think that um, it's important to study them and so we think that there's a lot of potential uses for, can for cannabinoids and cannabis, but we need to do the research. <clears throat>